Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Trotta, the leader in crowdsourced online advertising marketing, and by eMinutes, lawyers who focus on forming and maintaining corporations and LLCs. Hey everybody, it's This Week in Startups. I'm Jason Calacanis, your host, and today we have an amazing guest. Rob Hayes is with us. He's a venture capitalist. He does first round capital. He's invested, or his firm has invested in over 100 companies, some of the best companies you've ever heard of, like Square and Uber. Uh, just awesome companies, awesome VC, tons of knowledge. Stay with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Oh, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm just doing a tweet here. We are live with VC at Rob Hayes on This Week in Startups. This Week in Startups is a program, if it's your first time tuning in, in which we discuss startup companies. We talk about how to start them, how to grow them, how to kill them, how to raise money for them, how to build them, how to grow them, how to kill them, repeat, rinse. You get the idea. I'm here with my trusty psychic, Tyler Crowley. Do we not have the applause? Uh, yeah. We don't have no. We don't do any the applause button. It's gonna yeah. be. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. It's gonna be a great, great episode. Uh, we have a great guest. Uh, venture capitalist Rob Hayes is with us. He uh, is one of the founders of First. You were one of the founders, right? I was not one of the founders. No. You weren't. They brought no, you no, in. No, no, no. I, I oh. came a year and a half later. We'll oh. Open up the West Coast office. Got it. So. Okay. Uh, with First Round Capital, if you guessed, they specialize in doing people's first rounds, and boy, have they done a lot of great ones. We're going to have an amazing episode. We've got guests the fake startup. We've got a lot of talk about what VCs think of when they invest in companies, why they invest in companies, which entrepreneurs they pick, which ones they pass on, and why. We're going to get into that detail, all the stuff you need to know as an entrepreneur. Uh, and one other thing you need to know as an entrepreneur is about eMinutes. They're a law firm with 20 years of service to the biggest names in sports, music, and film. And they are doing something insane. Uh, and these guys are real mentions. They are incorporating 500 corporations for first-time entrepreneurs for free. And they're paying the filing fees, like the fees you would normally pay to the state. Now, if you were going to incorporate, that's usually like three, four, five thousand dollars with a lawyer, plus you pay five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks in filing fees. These guys are doing it for free because they want to help the startup community and they want to get the word out about their company, eMinutes, and they have chosen this week in startups as the vehicle for that. If you are a first timer and you're serious about starting a company, not like ah, I have an idea for a company. No, you're you're starting a company and you actually want to incorporate and you want to take the step and become an entrepreneur. That's what eMinutes is for. You can follow them on Twitter at eMinutes and uh, go to eMinutes.com. Tell your network, tell everybody you know that eMinutes is actually paying your filing fees and doing all that legal work for you, saving you thousands of dollars. I mean, it's just amazing. I love you guys, Eight Minutes. Thank you so much for sponsoring independent media like This Week in Startups. And if you love this program and you love the fact that it's free, it is your gear, it is your humble honor, it is your duty, in fact, to say thank you at E Minutes on your Twitter account. Thank you so much, E Minutes. Hey, on the program today, Rob Hayes, venture capitalist extraordinaire. And um, you joined first round a year and a half. So first round was founded in late 2004, and I joined in mid-2006. Wow. Now, what were you doing before that? You were VC, always a VC or you were an entrepreneur? Well, yeah. So before that, I was at a place called the Midyar Network, which Pierre Oh, Pierre Midyar's yeah, Network. So, yes, yeah, right. So I was, I was That's when we met, yeah, when yeah, I was yeah. doing Web Logs Inc. Absolutely. And uh, that was, uh, uh, we had a phone call, actually. You were, yes. you were on the sideline I of basketball. I was playing basketball right. with Mark Jackson, right. uh, now the coach. And right. we had a call, and you were very interested in what we were doing, and we were just about I, to sell. Right. So it was like, I was, was like, I would love to raise money. You guys are awesome, Pierre. But, but, but I, we're selling. I have, be, since, before then and after then, I've never had a call with a founder who panted as much as you were panting. So clearly, yes. <laughs> clearly you were playing a pretty hard game that day. It, I, literally, I remember <laughs> it with Michael Chesson. Here in Santa Monica, it was yep. over on Lincoln and like, uh, whatever, past Wilshire. And um, I was playing basketball and you had texted me and I was like, yeah, let's talk. And Mark Jackson had come up to me, the famous New York Nick and now the coach of, um, uh, not Sacramento, uh, Golden State Warriors. Mm -hmm. He said, can I play basketball with you? And I said, you're Mark Jackson, of course. Can I play basketball with you? And then we called. We had a nice talk. And it didn't work out because we were selling. Um, but that's what you have. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Your speciality is getting into those deals early. 
Yes, definitely. We like to get into deals. We like to be the first kind of institutional capital into, right. into companies. Thus the name. Right. First round. Right. And right. your partner is in the firm? So I've got uh, Josh Koppelman and Howard Morgan uh, right. founded, the, founded the firm. Howard's um, been on the program. He, of course, was the chairman of Idea Lab and before right. that did some education company or whatever. He's a legend in the business. Right. And then Josh founded Half.com. Back and in sold the day. that to eBay. Right. And did you meet him through the eBay Pierre connection? I, is that how? It uh, act, well, I met him while I was at Omidyar Network, Got but it. not. I mean, it was we were working on a company together. So now, first round has done three funds or so. Yes. And what is the average? What are the round sizes? How much do you raise? Well, our fund size. Your has fund size traditionally right, yeah. been around a hundred and thirty million dollars. Now that seems like a third of what I hear is the sweet spot. A lot of these entre- a lot of these VC firms are telling me three hundred, four hundred million is what you want to raise as a. And this is down from the billion-dollar funds that VCs used to raise because the billion-dollar funds, they couldn't deploy it intelligently, right. but they got all these huge management fees. They got right. 2% of that billion dollars every year. Right. And then $300 million was sort of the sweet spot because if you have one big hit, it returns the entire fund. But mm-hmm. you guys are doing a little bit less than that, half that amount or a third that amount. What, what you're thinking on the optimal size of a venture capital fund? Well, I think th- when you look at how first round was started, there was a, there was a, a, what we called a funding gap mm. in the environment. And this is, you had, you had a world where there were a lot of three to $500 million funds, but you had seen a, a certain class of company get very uh, capital efficient. Mm. So you'd gone from you know, these internet companies in 95 that were taking millions of dollars to start up because you had, you, know, you had to buy Sun servers and you had to buy Oracle databases and bandwidth was very expensive. It to, was six months or a year and a million dollars to fire up the website. Right, right. Uh, to today, when you know, I mean, too, when we started, and it was MySQL servers, which were free, right, for mm. more or less, and and, and or MySQL databases and Dell kind of servers, uh, you know, mm-hmm. off the shelf, and bandwidth was almost free, right. To today, when you've got cloud services where you can, you know, with a credit card, fire up a data center, right, mm. in in you know, a, you know, a few minutes, right. And so uh, and so these companies were taking less and less to get started up, but there were, the the venture funds were set up to write. You know, three million dollar, five to million dollar initial checks, right. and so and so. You know, we we decided to have a fund that was structured around a smaller check size, a uh, five hundred to, you know, seven. It's pretty six. visionary to do that at the time. Were Josh and Howard visionary, or were they just up and coming in the industry and only had the ability to raise fifty million dollars? Oh, I think that it was it was uh, it was because that was a depressed time, two thousand four, right. two thousand five. No, it was it was a very deliberate decision to build a fund that was structured for the, the, those type of those capital efficient companies. In a way, it was the first micro VC, right? The first of these, you know. Now you have Dave McClure, you have Saka, you have Mike Arrington, Crunch right. Fund, Five Hundred Startups. They're all doing essentially what First Round did right. in two thousand four, two thousand five. Correct. Mm-hmm. 30, so, 40, 50 million dollar funds so, trying yeah, to put I mean, 250 was, to 500 to 750 thousand dollars. I mean, around the same time we were doing it, you had, you know, a few others. You had the True Ventures guys. True Ventures right? guys had, had, but they, didn't they have like a 250 million dollar fund? I don't know what the size of it was. Yeah, it was, it was the same sort of same sort of model. Yeah. And then you had, you know, you had Mike Maples now with Flo- now with you know now Floodgate, Floodgate and yeah. you had you know Steve Anderson mm-hmm. um, who had a great. Um, exit this week. So what was his exit this week? Uh, Instagram. Oh yes, of course, yeah. yes. So um, what's different about what you guys do than say the bigger firms, the Sequoias, the Kleiners, those guys don't choose to race in and try to put 250 in. They think it's too small and they own too small a percentage of ownership in a startup. Is that the difference, the percentage ownership? Well, I think that, that they own, um, they own, I mean, they, they do have ownership thresholds that they want to get over. And, and yeah. you know, our model is more of a, let's, uh, uh, you know, less about ownership thresholds, although, and, and more about how, how active are we going to be. And so, why, why is ownership threshold so important to VCs? And what is ownership threshold? Ownership Define threshold it for people is, who are so ownership threshold means how much of the company do you own, right? And so, I think your traditional venture capital firm wants to go in and own, call it twenty percent of a company. It's the number that everybody talks about. And I think the reason that, that is is because if you look at, you know, if you think about venture capital being a, a home run business where one or two investments across a fund, make that fund, right. then it's important that you, you have significant ownership in, in all of your investments for, for the one or two that are going to make the fund. Got right. it. So they're going to place whatever, 20 bets, 30 bets. They don't want to have a bet hit, and they've only owned 5% of it. They right. want to own 20% of Instagram. Right. Now, what do you guys 
target to own, or do you not target to have a percentage, a certain percentage ownership? No, we don't. I mean, you know, um, we don't really have a target. So, I mean, I, I like to own about 10% if I'm going to take a board seat, right? Ah, if you're going to take a board seat. Right. Now, why is that? Uh, just because I, if I, I want to have, if, I, if I'm going to be spending a lot of time with the company, mm -hmm. then, you know, I want to make sure that it's something that where, where, you know, we have, we have some, some ownership in. Now, a lot of the new dynamics in angel investing, which is sort of the level you guys operate on, right. correct? You're sort of like angel or a round. We, we invest with angels meaning right. a lot. Um, it seems that AngelList has had a profound impact on aggregating a large number of angels. There seems to be three or four times as many angels right now today. Mm -hmm. And the rounds are getting filled up very quickly mm -hmm. with nobody owning more than $100,000 in a $10 million round or something. Uh -huh. So nobody really owns more than one, two, three, four percent. Does mm -hmm. that mean you're not participating in those rounds because you can't get to five or ten? How do you reconcile we haven't, that? I mean, we've participated in some of them. We haven't yeah. participated in a lot of them. Right. Um, I think that the bigger issue there is is not it's not an ownership thing. It is a, um, you know, I like to see someone who who someone in the in the investment syndicate who's kind of taking ownership for helping the company. Got it. Somebody so, who cares. Right, somebody who who has enough ownership to really care. Right. And, as long, and so it doesn't have to be me. But I want it to be somebody. Right. And right. somebody, preferably, that you trust. Right. So when these entrepreneurs come out and they do these angel rounds and they raise 500 to a million five and nobody's in charge, mm -hmm. is that in their best interest or not? I think it's not. And Why? I think that, well, because I think that, you know, every founder starts out, and I think rightly so, being very optimistic. You wouldn't start a company if you, if you weren't being optimistic, right. right? And so you're very optimistic about how things are going to go. The reality is, is that you know companies hit rough patches, and they always do. And and you want the kind of that experienced help, someone that's going to roll up their sleeves and spend some time with you um, when that happens. Uh, and and so if you go to you know a bunch of investors that have very little interest in your company, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to get as much help as you would if there's that one person that is like committed to say, okay, I'm really going to, I'm going to be the one that they have more skin in the game. Yeah. Now you've lived through a couple of bubbles and bursts. Mm -hmm. Are we in a bubble right now or not? Not yet. I think we're on our way. What percentage of the way to bubble are we? In <laughs> you know, Rob Hayes' mind. Give no, me an I, don't, exact I, don't, I, I honestly don't know, but I, I mean, here, here's. All right, what are the, what's the evidence that we're in a bubble? What's the evidence we're not in a bubble? So, so I think that the evidence that we're. There's I, a really interesting leading indicator on whether or not there's a bubble in the valley. Oh. And, and what is that? Well, I can guess that. Something to do with cars or houses mm. or the, vacation? Less obvious. Oh, traffic. Traffic no. was definitely mm -hmm. one. Yeah. yeah. Billboards? The, this on is the looking at the last, call it two. Mm -hmm. The last two bubbles. Yeah. The last two bubbles, leading indicator, reservations at restaurants? No. What? Oh, great. That's that is probably. I, I know that the highway traffic is the definitely traffic, one. The of traffic them. is a big one, especially in the Bay Area. Yes, right? because I mean, people the, taking the, the time the, to go the, from the San Francisco. Real, the the mean time to Palo Alto to, between Palo Alto and San Francisco is is you know changes with yes. the economy. I also think it's maybe the number of rental cars and hotel rooms available because I know that the last couple of times I've gone to the Valley. I agree. Yeah. The rental car situation and the you know was ridiculous. And going to Sand Hill Road instead of just getting a rental car, the rental cars went up to 140 bucks when they used to be like 50 bucks. So anyway, go ahead, tell tell us. I'll have to look up the source, but it was breast augmentation. No. Oh. What? <laughs> yes. In San Francisco? Yes. People don't get that up there. I know they don't. <laughs> what, what on, how on earth could that ever be correlated? Thanks for ruining this great interview. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> not total non sequitur, Tyler. No. It, uh, the really? data overlaps All right. very All right. So anyway, but getting back to bubbles. Bubbles, right? not and those bubbles. No, so <laughs> we're talking about. We're getting very close to the, the jar. Here. We're getting very close um, to the square, <laughs> jar. I'm put the square jar right here between Tyler and Rob. Yeah. Okay, so, so where are we at? Bubble, I mean, no so, bubble. So I don't know exactly where we're at. And, yeah. and when I talk about us being on the way to a bubble as opposed to not, I right. just I think that that there's just always been a pattern of bubble then no bubble, bubble then burst, bubble then burst, bubble then burst. That's just okay. the way it goes. Right. Right. And so you know, do I look at today and go, oh my God, we're in a Why? bubble? Why is that bubble burst? Uh, because because what happens is you know people start seeing things like Instagram okay and and they see oh my gosh it's it's a, a mobile photo sharing company uh, that just got bought for a billion dollars right and and you know and so everybody wants part of that action 
right? right. And so they and, and so who's everyone? Everybody that had you know every accredited investor, I guess. So, so anybody with over a million dollars, a couple of million worth, bucks of net worth, says and, yeah. I want to get in on and that. And they feel like they have some access and they want to go in. And this is not this is not everybody. But what happens is it has to, you know, it begins to inflate prices and people begin to get excited about deals and mm. and so companies come you know companies that, you know uh, there there begins to get a lot of froth around investments. Got it. And then and then what happens is when people start talking about a bubble. And you know what I found, like if you talk, if you remember back to '98, mm -hmm. there were people that were pulling out of the market because they thought, "Oh my God, right, this is a huge bubble." And right? they missed those. And last they two missed years. those last two years, which was now, 80. They were of the right. Bubble. You know, I mean, people were talking about the real estate bubble. I mean, Peter Pham yeah. was talking about the real estate bubble for years, right? And he was right. But you know, the the question is. Well, can you time it. it? Can you time it? And you can't. And I choose not to. And so I think that we just continue to invest at the same rate. Right. You know, across, across time. Was Instagram a bubble-like purchase in your mind? No, it was a great company. Why? Because I think they're growing like crazy. I think that they own. They own. I mean, because when you look at what people are doing on Facebook, mm -hmm. it's photos. Right. right. I mean, it's a lot of things, but it's, it's about a, lot a third of, of Facebook's right. traffic probably right. is photo and, related. And so when you look at mobile photos, who's doing that? It's Instagram. And right. if you think that. Facebook has to become a you know a, you know they I think they already do, do a good job on mobile but they need to own mobile right they need and, to own it right and, and 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 they also need to correct me if I'm wrong block anybody else from owning it because right. it's a major risk factor mm -hmm. is that correct ah uh, is it, it fear or opportunity that drove the purchase of Instagram I, I'm going to assume it's opportunity I don't know I'm not in I'm not in the halls of Facebook well but you've seen people make purchases so what do you when you see a purchase like that. Twitter didn't make it, Google didn't make it, Apple didn't make it, but Facebook did. Mm -hmm. Is that Zuckerberg sees some opportunity that they don't? Is that he has funny money and to spend? So, or maybe it oh, no, helps the it's, IPO. Uh, it's definitely part. I mean, my, my, you know, I don't. Again, I don't know, but well, my that, guess is it's definitely is your, part of the plan. What is your analysis? There's a plan and a vision that goes along with it. Uh, I do not think it was panic. It wasn't I, panic. No, I don't think so. Why? Why didn't Google, Apple, or Twitter buy it? Uh, you know, I think. Um, when you when are you uncomfortable talking about these acquisitions because you have companies that have to get bought by them like you don't want to no, talk no, about no, the no, acquirers? No, 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 oh, okay. no, that's not at all. No, I think that I, I just I, I think that the visionary buys when you look at what, what Google did with YouTube right. back in the day, which was when visionary. Everybody thought it was crazy. One point six billion right? for a and, video hosting and it was, site. Yeah, and it was absolutely with the a right lawsuit. thing to do. Right. If YouTube was an independent company right now, how much would it be worth? I have no idea. But I think I, I don't know what it would be worth. Billions, hundreds of yeah. millions of users. It's yeah. got ten times the number of users right. as so Instagram. Call it, let's call it, call it, yeah, fifteen million dollars, fifteen billion dollars, easily, right? right? Easily, so, great buy, right? Incredible. And I, th I think that Instagram may be along those same lines. Instagram didn't ever try to make money. Mm -hmm. Hipstamatic, other photo um, apps that had filters and other mm -hmm. things charged. Mm -hmm. Was that a mistake to try to get revenue for Hipstamatic and those other ones? Are you an investor in Hipstamatic or no, any no, other I'm ones? Not. No, I'm not. I mean, so, so um, uh, no. Uh, so I, I think that there are those companies where you don't understand how they're ever going to make revenue, mm -hmm. and 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 so you focus on, and so investors focus focus on putting a lot of money in to grow them, figuring okay. out at some point they'll example? figure out Twitter. Okay, it's a great example, right? Right. I mean, and. So don't worry about revenue. Well, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, and then there are companies where I think it's kind of obvious how you can make revenue. Got it. And when I look at a example, uh, ex Instagram. Right. I think that you. What's I, the obvious way to make money? Well, I mean, you start charging for different filters, little got things like it. that. Ninety-nine cents. Right. You got forty million users. Yeah. One percent buy a filter. So I think them focusing on four hundred thousand people absolutely have the right thing for them to do. Right. Absolutely. And the Hipstamatic, which came out, I don't know, a year and a half before it, and mm -hmm. I, I bought Hipstamatic. Mm -hmm. Great app that did all that stuff and had lenses and all that stuff. And I was like, I'll just buy. I opened it up and it was whatever it's a dollar, two dollars. Right. Each lens was a dollar, two dollars. I was like, I'm going to buy every single one because in total it would be fifteen dollars. But this is like getting a three hundred dollar camera right. or five hundred dollar camera for ten bucks, fifteen right. bucks. So I bought every one. I used it and then hip Instagram came out and it was just bet more social right. and free. So then I stopped using Hipstamatic. Right. So what's your advice to young entrepreneurs? Go big or go revenue? Because you hear conflicting advice. I think that if, if you know, if, if how you're going to make revenue is obvious, mm -hmm. or you know, if there's a, a bunch of different ways to make revenue, then focus on growth. So I, I, mean, I had this conversation yesterday with a, with a company here, where, where it, you know, in Santa Monica, where it was like, 
you know, you know how you're going to make money. This is not an issue. Don't focus on that. Focus on growth. Focus on user acquisition. Distribution is the absolute hardest thing to do with an internet company. So if you can get a large audience, and it's if you know how to, you're going to make money, get the large audience and then add money, as yeah. opposed to trying to squeeze money out of people early on. Right. Because Why? that slows growth. It slows growth. Right. And growth is what sells, right? Gl growth is where you get the highest valuations. If you in have M&A. In M&A or, yeah. So I'm running Mahalo.com right, right now. We've got 25, 30 apps out in iOS. We've got a bunch in Android. We're charging for apps. We're making a good living. Mm -hmm. you know, apps can make 50, 100, 200 dollars sure. a day. Should I just go all free and not try to make money and just try to get massive growth in our base and then, because we have plenty of money in the bank, yeah. and then figure out revenue in year two or three? Not now, not once you've started ch charging. Right, I mean, ah. <laughs> I mean, you can, right. but you know, I don't know enough about your business. I think you're, at, but your business is at a scale where, you yeah, know, we make millions of dollars, right. but we could have probably tens of millions of users instead of hundreds of thousands on our apps. Mm -hmm. So, am I making a mistake? Should I go bigger? Am I holding myself back by charging? You might be. You might be. I mean, I'm having this discussion with myself. Yeah, I mean, you, you you clearly don't think so because you are charging, right? But no, I'm charging because I'm a 40 year old guy who, in, you know, always charged for his magazines and always thought that that's the way it should be. What what I have found is that when so so you know we invest in companies at a very early stage, mm -hmm. and so I think a lot about raising the round after that and the round after that. Right. Got it. And so, so you, you're investing in angel round, and you're immediately thinking A and B round. Right. And so when I why look why do at, you do that as a fees, as an investor? Uh, because every company we invest in is going to need more capital. By right? definition. By definition. Yeah. Right? You've never had it happen that people raised an angel round and were like, we don't need any money. They, I mean, on, honestly, there are companies that haven't needed more money, but they've been able to raise it, and so they have. But they've raised it for growth. Right? Raised they've for growth. raised it for growth. So you keep centering around growth. Yeah. Everything's so, about growth. And so when, when these companies go out and they talk to that next stage venture capitalist right. about raising that next round, the story is always, I mean, when, when you say, I've got a profitable business, they go, that's great. How fast are you growing? Right? right. They don't even care. Yeah. And Facebook didn't. Let's. Facebook didn't care about revenue for more years than they did. Right. And Twitter certainly is just starting people, to turn on. And there were a lot of people. A lot of people in the early days that wasn't. They weren't sure how Facebook was going to make revenue. I couldn't. And it, I, I couldn't figure it out because I was like, right. I don't think anybody wants to advertise on. And now they're. And now they're. They're doing. Pounding it. Yeah. Pounding. Many billions of dollars of revenue. Right. Right. And it's a fixed cost business. Right. So it scales infinitely. Right. I mean, they could cut. What half the number of employees, two-thirds mm -hmm. of employees, and make the profit even greater right. if they didn't care about growing features and right. delighting their users. Right. All right. When we get back, I want you to answer the question that everybody wants to know mm -hmm. the answer to, which is when you meet an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. what signals of quality do you look for mm -hmm. that make you say, I have to fund this person? And what signals do you get that make you say, I absolutely am not going to fund this person or this idea? when we get back from this incredible commercial break. How's that for a teaser? Good teaser. A cliffhanger. Yeah. It's a cliffhanger. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, but one thing, you talked about growth. Mm -hmm. And there are only a small handful of ways to grow a business online. Mm -hmm. There's organic growth, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. There's viral growth, distribution partners. What mm -hmm. other growth is there? And there's hacking Craigslist with yeah. a team in Manila. There's that too. Mm -hmm. Gray hat stuff. Mm -hmm. What other ways are there to grow a business? Well, what, so SEO, SEM, right? I SEO, mean, right. SEM, right. search engine optimization, mm -hmm. and? Search engine marketing. Which is when you? Buy ads on search engines. You buy engines. traffic, right. that's right. And is that a difficult thing to do? Is it complicated? No. Not at all? Well, I mean, it, not, not, for a, not for an SEM expert. <laughs> ah, not for an SEM expert. And those are hard to find, aren't they? They can be. And they're expensive. Mm -hmm. An SEM expert, that's what Trotta does. Trotta is an amazing startup in Colorado. Boulder. We met them when we were there. Yes, Neil. Neil, great guy, incredible entrepreneur, raised a ton of money, and he showed me his business. This is a wonderful business. You're crowdsourcing SEM experts. Not every startup can mm -hmm. afford an SEM expert, and you may only need an SEM expert for right. a couple of months to teach you how to do something. And that's what we've seen with DocStock mm -hmm. or Smarty Pants, a bunch of different things. They use Trotta for a couple of months. Trotta basically gets them up and running in the SEM world. You say, this is how much I can afford to spend uh, buying a customer, getting a customer into my conversion funnel. And then they have all their SEM experts, and some of these are like working full time at companies, I think, and then they're just like moonlighting. So they've got all this knowledge working for some big, huge company, probably. They then farm it out to those people 
who work and find the keywords that you wouldn't even think of because you, can, you might find words in Spanish or other alternate words or mobile words and you might land all this amazing traffic and Trotta's going to teach you how to do that. Um, Trotta is uh, an expert at using Google, Yahoo, Bing, Facebook, and writers, uh, they make the money when they get the conversion. So it's really paper for performance. These ad professionals uh, over there are incredible and they've got great support. Mention you heard about um, Trotta on Twist, and you'll get awesome support and no setup fees. Everybody who watches this program, please thank at Trotta from the bottom of your heart for making free independent media like this free. It's free. You don't have to pay for the show because Trotta cares about producing media like this, and they produce a great product that helps entrepreneurs. It's an awesome product. We've used it. We love it. Thank you at Trotta, and you should thank Trotta too on your Twitter account. And try them out. They're awesome at what they do. Pretty good ad read? Very good. I love reading ads. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. When it's a good product, I love reading it. Okay. You meet with how many entrepreneurs per week? Per week. Uh, 10 per to month. 20? 10 to 20 a week. Yeah. So 50 a month, no yeah. problem. There are things, mm -hmm. red flags, mm -hmm. or just starter pistols, mm -hmm. that make you either want to invest in a company or not. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. What are they? <laughs> so the things that I like. Be honest. So yeah. one of the things that I tell. As honest as possible. One of the things that I tell early founders that, mm. that I, I say, listen, that being a CEO of an early stage company is actually pretty easy. You need to do two things. Right? Two things, a CEO of an early stage company. Right. You need to hire the best possible people, uh -huh. one. And two, you need to make sure your company doesn't run out of money. Now, there's a lot, of, a lot, of, a lot, there's a lot underneath that, right? But if you do those two things mm. successfully, you're likely to have you're you're likely to have a good run, right? A good run, yeah. Yeah, and so and so those are the things that I look for. I look for people that are focused. I mean, so when someone comes to me and they've already surrounded themselves with people that have quit good jobs, not not on the sidelines, but have quit good jobs to come and work with this person, because they're so passionate about what, one working with this person, but also what they're working on. To me, that's that's like that's a good indicator, right? That's the ultimate tell. If right. you can get qualified people mm -hmm. to join your team, mm -hmm. pre-funded, pre-funded, yeah. yeah. that says something about yeah. a person. Yeah, that's a great point because a lot of wannabe entrepreneurs keep getting stuck on this issue of how do I start without the money? Mm -hmm. But the guys who manage to do it, right? Because mm -hmm. some people can do it. Well, there are entrepreneurs. That's, that really right. is the big difference. There are entrepreneurs and there are entrepreneurs. Right. right. Like there's people who want to be entrepreneurs and there's entrepreneurs. Right. And you're talking about entrepreneurs. Right. They come up and they have a great idea, I got a great market, I got great wireframes, right. and you say, who, who are you working with? Right. Who's your number one hire? And they say, uh, uh. Right. So if somebody doesn't have that, right. that's a red flag. That is, it is a red flag, yeah. What else is a red flag? A red flag, to, one of the things, so I, I have this happen to me all the time, and I'm, I'm pretty upfront with founders when they come in. When they start going through a deck and they've got, 20 pages, 20 slides on their product, mm. and they're not getting into like distribution, they're not getting into team, they're mm. not getting into any of the other parts of the business, they're just so enamored with their product. I mean, there's been very few products that, that have been so good that the world just beat a path to their door, mm -hmm. right? Now there's a few, Google, back in the early days, Facebook, sure. back in the early days, and I think those Twitter. are the ones, Twitter, right? OMG those, Pop. Those are the ones that people focus on. Right. But a lot of the really the successful, outliers. right? A lot of the really successful companies had really good operators running them, mm. that you know know how to market, know how to sell, know how to do deals, you know know how to manage you know uh, an income statement, know how to hire, know, mm. you know all of those things. Right. right. So are, when you see somebody come in and they're just like obsessing about product, but not even bringing up the other things, you right. think. Well, if this guy's Steve Jobs or Larry Page and Sergey Brin, maybe it could work out for them, right. or they're Mark Zuckerberg or right. whatever. But you'd rather see a Mark Pincus type who comes in and says they know distribution, right. they know hiring, they know marketing, they right. know SEM, they know all this stuff. Right. And someone, well that understands, and, and someone that understands that, you know, one of the, most of the businesses that I look at at the very early days, there have been very few businesses that I've been involved with that haven't changed fairly significantly mm -hmm. as, they, as they've, you know, kind of grown. Um, and so someone you know, that is so enamored with their product and they can't think through how things might change, or they're focused on one particular slice of the market, of a market that they don't know how to, they, they only know that piece of the market and not a much bigger market, something like that, mm -hmm. those are all things that, that I, would, I would be concerned about. One of the complaints I hear about investors is they don't get back to you, they delay. Mm -hmm. 
When you're not going to invest in something, how quickly do you tell the person no, and how do you tell them? So I'll often tell them in the first meeting, and I'll and I'll I will say this is not a good fit for us okay. for these reasons, and right. I'll explain the reasons. You'll go into the reasons. I, I will. I mean, I you know I will go into the reasons. Mm. I mean, if it's someone that I just like don't connect with, I'm generally not going to say that. Mm. But you know, if it's someone where you know it's 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 kind of a listen. I don't believe you know I don't understand this market enough to to believe that it can get as big as you can you you think it can. Ah, right. So that's an easy one. Right. I, I, I just don't know this market. It's right. not working. And I have that sometimes. Somebody you pitches me on a biotech company right. or something. I can easily say no to that. Right. But if somebody pitches you on something that's in the consumer web or mobile and games right. and you know whatever software as a service and it's in your wheelhouse, right. And you've got to say no to them. Right. That's a little bit more difficult. It's a little more difficult. But I mean, you know, I will say things like you know, I one thing one thing that I've I've said no to people about a number of times is. They're, they build a product and then they want to slide. They're like, we need and now we need to hire a designer to come uh, in. And I'm like, no, see, I, I don't, I, I don't like that way. I like yeah. the way where you actually build a product with design built in from the very beginning. Right. Because I think design, when I, you know, so I was, uh, so you know, I, we led the first round in a company called Mint.com. Mint.com, and, right? Launched at the first year of our conference. Right. Yes. A- absolutely. And, and one, and, it got sold to Intuit for three hundred million or something. Like that. Less than that, but yeah, um, but. Uh, it, you know, Aaron had an idea for what the product should look like and was fanatical about was like beautiful. design and how it worked and, and, and the ease of use and it just you know and, and so you know he did things that other people just didn't do mm-hmm. because they thought it was either too hard or too expensive, like work with Yodely to make sure that people didn't you know today to, up to that point everybody when they had like some sort of Intuit killer mm-hmm. or you know QuickBooks killer, they had to type in their transactions. Ugh. Right? And Aaron said that's silly. You're tra- you're, the data's out there. Let's just release that data and make sure that it flows into this application. That's a really hard problem to solve. But uh, it, was, it was essential to Aaron for it to work that way because it had to be brain dead easy for so people see, to So yeah, seeing some deafness in product design right. um, is key. Now, in the market today, it seems like every product is really well designed. No, oh, no. No? No. You see a lot of ugly products. Yeah, I do. But can't you just go on 99designs and spend 500 to 1000 dollars getting your site refreshed and make a great looking site? No. No, it's no it's I think it's, it's not that easy. Well, you're, no, you're talking about more than just the design. I'm talking the, about when I talk about design, I'm not talking about the, the colors and, and you're talking and, about yeah. UX design, I'm talking about UX look and, and feel, yeah, everything. Yeah, everything. Feel. That takes right. ballsy decision making yeah. sometimes on like in Aaron's case with Mint, where you make something frictionless enough that it's a joy to use, but it's a so much of a hassle to do that on the back right. end that it's like threatens the life of the, whether mean, or not it'll work. Years ago, I worked at Palm, right? And you worked at Palm? Oh yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. And so one of the um, one of the, the great the things, Palm Pilot, right? The Palm Pilot, which was the first digital system, was the first iPhone, right? Without an iPhone, without right. a carrier in right. it, right? And so and so you know, engineers when they build functionality, they want to expose it to the user, mm, right? right? And one of the things that Jeff Hawkins was really good at was saying no, saying no a lot to features, functionality, Feature exposing creep, yeah. um, functionality to users. I mean, you know, the Palm OS did a lot more than users ever saw. Mm-hmm. But, you know, th- I mean, in the early days, it was like there was a, we called it preferences panels, which was, you know, the one place where you could make the app work differently yeah. than it could. And you, you essentially had five slots for preferences, and you had one panel per app. Wow. And that was it. And you know that was all that got exposed to the user, and it, and some users would get you know kind of upset because things wouldn't work the way they thought they should. Right. But for the majority of users, it was right. Right. And this is sort of Steve Jobs' triumph in product design right. has been minimalism and functionality right. over features. We've gotten to the point in the industry where people just want stuff to work, right? As opposed to being enamored by the feature set, right? And all the all it can do, right? We've been overwhelmed by Microsoft Office's feature set, right. and now we want some light version of it. Yeah. Um, but I, I Evernote. Yeah. I tweeted out the other day. That, I mean, there's so much work to do, right? Because I set up a wireless printer in my house. Uh huh. And after getting on the phone with the printer manufacturer, doing and you know, and them not being able to fix the problem, and every, uh-huh. you know, it took me three hours to get this thing working on my wireless network. I finally did get it working, but you know, I, I have a lot of experience with technology, and so and three hours a, is it, about two hours of fifty nine minutes too much. Wait, wait too much. You should just turn it on. It should work. It should just work. And it doesn't. And it didn't. <laughs> so let's talk about specific deals. Let's talk about 
your biggest hit. You're, you did the seed round of Uber. I was in that as well. Right. That was a pretty hotly contested deal. How did you get that? Uh, you know, I just, I mean, honestly, it just, uh, I saw Garrett Camp, who uh -huh. we knew from Stumble, Stumble Upon, Upon, because we were investors in Stumble Upon, ah. and I saw him tweeting out about it, mm. um, about Uber, and it sounded interesting. And so I reached out to him, and I said, so what is this thing? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and we talked about it, and I tried the service, and I fell in love with it. Um, and so I put a term sheet down. And this was over 4th of July, a year and a half ago, two, almost two years ago. Uh, I was on vacation. <laughs> and he said and, yes. And yeah, and I negotiated a term sheet, you know, from a bad connection on the beach in Oregon. <laughs> um, so. And now that's your biggest hit. Well, one I don't know if it's our biggest hit. I mean, you know, we. I. I, I think that it's, it's. It's. It looks to be a very successful company, and so. Oh my, we're so modest. I mean, the the, the you if you invested in the angel round, that had to be very tiny. I was in there as well. Very tiny, and then. This latest round, people reported hundreds of millions of dollars. This is a huge success. This one investment, correct me if I'm wrong, would pay back your entire fund. Oh, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't run the numbers. I don't run the numbers. I don't, and, I, and, I don't, and I don't talk about the numbers. You I don't mean, talk about the numbers. I mean, it, but as a VC, you must be calculating these numbers constantly. You have a fiduciary responsibility to your LPs, correct? I think about it. You yeah. think about it. Yeah. All right, so but it's all. But so it's, you're trying to be. You, you have to have a little discretion in what you talk about since you're. Yes, I understand. You have to have a little discretion right now. Yeah. Okay, so we'll allow a little discretion. Mm -hmm. But I can say that this is your biggest hit and pay back your entire fund, uh, since the fund's only $120 million. What's the next biggest hit? What's the, what are the big major hits has the first I round I think we have a lot of, others? I mean, I think we've, we've there, there's been a no, I mean, I don't want to talk about our fund so much. I mean, I want to talk about, I want to talk about startups. No, I know, but it's, it's important for your credibility to at least talk about those and then what I mean, you so, saw so, them. Some, so let's, some, let's start that way. Some what companies, have been huge some hits companies and then, that people might recognize are things yeah. like mint.com, right. fab.com. Fab.com, right. Jason Goldberg. Right. I passed, I'm an idiot. No, keep going. You, um, well, it was, a, it was the gay social network at first, and I was right. like, I, and what I said to him was, I, do, I logged in, and I was like, I really don't know enough about the gay lifestyle to be a great angel investor, but, and then he pivoted. I know, he did. And, <sighs> but, but, you know, I think that often you make, invest, you make investments based on the, the founders. Uh, and I did, right. I loved Jason Goldberg. Right. He was so awesome. Right. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> we all have regrets. Okay, um, so, so Fab. Uber, Square. Uber, squ uh, square? Yeah. You were, you were in the a, this uh, A round of Square? Yes. Holy Toledo. Yeah, that's a fun one. And, um, uh, is Jack and, a genius? Yeah, he is, absolutely. I mean, he's pretty much a genius. Yeah, he right? really he invented is. Twitter and Square. If you invent two things like that, you're a genius. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was a genius when he invented the first one. But, I mean, he's just, he's just a very visionary guy. Right? Is he the next Steve Jobs, you think, in your mind? You and know, if not him, who? He's, he's much too nice to be the next Steve Jobs. But. Correct. Right. <laughs> but, in terms of his ability, I think, I think. Is it Steve Jobs level? I think level? he has something preternatural, yes. Is it Steve Jobs level? I don't, I, you know, Steve Jobs wasn't Steve Jobs when he was, you know, 30. Fair enough. Right, so. Yeah. Um, but you get a Steve Jobs sense? Like, there's something special about him, for sure. You think he's going to produce some things next that will be bigger than the things he's created previous? I think he's going to continue to produce things that really blow people away. And I'm sure that he'll have his, you know, his. Uh, his Lisa's along the way, right? But yeah, but you know, I mean, that's just that's the way it works, right? And you're referring, of course, to Steve Jobs' Lisa computer, not his actual daughter, right? <laughs> uh, you read the Steve Jobs biography? I have not. You have not? No, no. Okay, it's on my list. It's on your list. Yeah. Listen to the Audible book; it's incredible. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you another question. If you were on the board of Apple, mm -hmm. you're not. No, I'm not. And you were sitting there with thirty, forty billion dollars that you could give as a dividend, mm -hmm. or that you could make a purchase of a company with. Mm -hmm. And which would you do? Would you purchase companies, or would you give the dividend? If you were on the board, what would your advice be to Tim Cook? Well, you know, I'm, I, you know, <laughs> I mean, the obvious right answer is if you're on the board, you have a fiduciary duty to return, to, to return as much value to shareholders as you can, mm -hmm. right? And so if so I do you think, think that came from, would come from, a sto from buying so companies? If I think that I could, I mean, I think that there's almost always a way to to produce more value by growing the company mm -hmm. um, than by giving a cash dividend. Right. And, and so if you can grow the company in a way that makes sense um, through acquisition, then absolutely you should be acquiring companies. Now, what would be the number one company you'd buy if you were on the board of Apple? Um, what would be the most intelligent purchase for them to make? Or the two, or three. 
How's the investor in Square? Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I mean, I, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> no, you absolutely can't not going to talk about my my, my portfolio. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, you know, I think that. I mean, you know, Apple is a product company, right? Right, and so the question is, do they need to get into? Like, do they need to become more of a service company? Do they need to become more of a, uh, a, a social networking company? Yes. Do they need to become something other is? than... A, I don't think they do. I think they're a great no? product company. So they don't need to do iCloud? They could just be Dropbox and integrate that? They don't need to have data centers? They don't need to own an authentication service? So the one, the one thing that Apple's been really good at, and the thing that I think is brilliant about what they do, and this, this is something that I get from my time at Palm, is the software-hardware integration on those products is seamless. Mm -hmm. And when it's not, it sucks, mm -hmm. right? It's really bad. MobileMe. M MobileMe, for example, right? And so do they need to have an integrated service like that? I, I believe they do. Now, iCloud is right? delightful. Now, Dropbox, does Dropbox, you know, you know, Dropbox works across all these platforms. It's brain dead simple. I don't know that it would be that hard to integrate. Right, into, but they didn't, they did iCloud. Right. So Apple. does that mean the logical so, extension is that they should buy Twitter? If you're on the board, would you? If you're on the board and they said, "Hey, buy Twitter or don't buy Twitter," mm -hmm. you're saying yes. Oh yeah, I, I, I mean, why not? Right? I mean, it's the no-brainer acquisition right, for them. Right. That's not really Apple's DNA to acquire. But but the How thing is, it's, it's really also it? you know, I, 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 I don't know that they get. It I don't know that they get that kind of company necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason they build they built iCloud instead of buying something is because their DNA is we can do it better. Now, yeah. I think that's right on yeah. the hardware side, and mm -hmm. it's right on the integrated software side. I think eventually it's going to be right mm -hmm. on that kind of cloud service side, that integrated service side. Yeah. They haven't figured that piece out yet, but I think they will. They have to. These are connected devices. They are not, they are not standalone devices. If Apple bought Twitter and Square and made Jack the CEO, hmm. would that be a good move? Again, I'm not talking about my company. Would you vote for that? Would you like, vote for again, that? We're not, I'm not talking about my company. Oh, come on. Would you vote for it on the board to buy those two things and make him CEO? If you say no right now, when he sees this, he, you're going to... I'm not gonna, saying... I'm there's gonna, only I'm one correct answer right now, which is yes. I'm going to take the coward's way out. I'm going to avoid the square jar, and I'm just going to say no comment. Okay. I think... You tell me, Tyler. Pleading the fifth. Yeah. Apple has to buy Twitter, and... Why? Because they need an authentication service some way for people to say, this is who I am. They already have their credit card They already have the credit card. I know, but they... Why doesn't Apple, why doesn't Apple release some kind of identity platform right. that everyone, much like... Google did. No, no, much like Facebook, um, Facebook did with Connect. Well, Facebook Connect and Google's but then it's authentication the credit, You get along the credit card with it. A little, you know. Of course, and that would be Square. Yeah, perfect. But they already have that with your, your iTunes account. They do have your why iTunes they, account, but yeah, the iTunes, you don't, iTunes if you could log in with iTunes, I guess, to other services, that would be pretty dope. Yes. If I could log into something with right. my iTunes yes. credentials, it would be, they haven't done it yet. God, Apple has so much opportunity. And as well as Google, as well. I mean, if It Google wouldn't be owned, Square at all, actually, because what Square is about is going into a merchant, having an amazing, seamless experience, much like we were talking about with yeah. Mint, mm -hmm. where you don't even have to take out your wallet. No, I just think you buy Square to get Jack. I think Jack uh, is the guy Square is an take. amazing amazing, amazing product, totally separate from anything to do with Have you ever, I mean, the, the growth of Square has been phenomenal, unprecedented? They're growing nicely. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. it's phenomenal. Is it? All right, let's play Guess the Fake Startup. Karen, we have three startups. These are the rules of the game. Karen, who's right behind you, okay. is going to tell us three startups. Okay. Right, three? Uh, that's correct. Two of them are real. Yes. One of them's fake. One of them is fake. Okay. 20 bucks each? You got it. 20? <laughs> 20, you for 20? Here we go. I don't know that I brought any. Right, here we go, baby. Do you take square? 20 bucks. <laughs> now, we, we may have people splitting 10s here. Mm -hmm. All right, I've got three 20s. Winner take all. If, uh, if somebody else wins, you got to split it three ways. If, not, if we all three of us get it right, we each take our 20 back. This right. is going to be awesome. If nobody gets it, Right. Uh -huh. It goes in the swear jar for the staff's uh, keg. Er. Make sense? Sounds good. Okay, here we go. Go ahead, Karen. Okay, so in honor of... a lot of, of steak right now. <laughs> in honor of the <laughs> upcoming Launch Education and Kids Conference, we okay. are having... Good plug, I like it. Yes, we're having three education startups. Mm -hmm. So the first and one... And two are real. Two are real. Okay. Okay, the first now, one... Now, wait a second. If, 
Rob knows one of them's real because he saw it or something. Does he have any responsibility to say? He's, no. What are, no. That's just, good, <laughs> that's just good research. Right. That's, yeah, okay. Where are the real ones coming from? No, 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 no. There's no you don't get to ask pre-questions. There's no pre-questions. What's the source of these real startups? Da, 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 da. You don't, let's not F with I mean, the game. How did they come about them? Don't worry. No, 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 no. no I, I can't answer that question okay. because Carolyn writes the description. Don't, don't, don't oh. give him any okay. feedback. Don't answer any questions because he's okay. looking for a tell, Kieran. Okay. Go ahead, read yours. All right. The first one is learningtrails.com. Learning Trails is a crowdsourced community that helps students of any age learn new and valuable skills. Members create lessons called trails for others to follow or build upon existing trails to create more focused lessons. Educators vetted by our team of experts can sell their skills lessons, books, skill lessons, books, or videos within the Learning Trails community. Okay. okay. Learning trails. Got Learning it. trails. Okay. Second one is schoolcues.com. School Cues is the cloud-based solution to help student to help schools facilitate and keep track of school to parent interactions. We help schools eliminate extra material expenses by taking the dialogue online while simultaneously improving parental engagement and teacher productivity. How do you spell the domain? School S C H O O L Cues C U E S dot com. All one word. Okay. Okay. Learning trails, school cues, got it. Right. Mm -hmm. And the third one is testsoup.com. Test soup. Yes. Test soup was created to reinforce the fundamentals that are needed to be successful with any standardized test. Students can learn hundreds of core math and verbal concepts with our proven self study method. They'll be able to do practice questions, which have detailed explanations from our test prep experts. And you can study online and on the go with our mobile app. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Do you know, do you know which one? Da, da, like? Don't answer any questions. Don't even look at him. Don't. He's the devil. <laughs> he's trying to get information. Okay. He's trying to ruin the game. I will summarize. Do not even make eye contact with him. Do not making eye contact with Tyler. Learning trails. Mm -hmm. You create a learning trail, and other people can follow it. And uh, you can sell it to other people in the community. Sounds interesting. School cues, a way of uh, making interaction between teachers and faculty and parents. School to parent interactions. School to parent interactions, cheaper and more affordable and easier, like an intranet, I guess, or something, or an extranet. Uh, and then test soup, test preparation, yes. essentially. OK, so I am going to write down which one. I'm going to, OK, here. You write down yours. You have a pen or no? No, I don't. Write yours. I, I do have. You're gonna, a I got a pen. You're going to say yours out loud. Okay. Um, after we write ours down. Okay. You should go first. You don't need to write. Ma, da, 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 da. Okay, Tyler, you're going to lose twenty bucks. I'm going to win. I found a tell. In oh, you did. This. I found a tell. I, I have one myself. I have a tell. Tell too. Boop. Boop, boop. <laughs> I have a tell. No. I got a tell from Karen. No, I didn't say a tail. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. All right, so here we go. Learning trails, school cues, test soup. Which one do you think is the fake one, and take us through why? Okay, so any one of these companies could be real, right? Of and course. So Ooh, Omar, yeah. I know, I know, but I mean, the thing is, is there's nothing unreasonable about any of these Well, they seem like good right? ideas. Yeah. Now, I don't know if they seem like good ideas necessarily, uh, but, they, but there's... there's um, mm. There's, there's a, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if any one of those came and pitched me, right? Okay. Um, so the, they're all the, reasonable. So the one that I'm going to go with is school cues, mm -hmm. just because they spell Q wrong. Got it. Right. Right. And it should be a Q, a line. Q. Be, think it, that would be. It should be either Q the the hard way, mm -hmm. you know, with the U E, mm -hmm. right? Or yep. it should be maybe Q C U, C U E. Right. But Q U E just doesn't make sense. Oh, uh, can okay. I can I interrupt? I it is C U E. Oh, it is CUE. Yes. Cool. Okay. All right. Oh, so wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. That totally changes it. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Everybody can change. You can change. So it's CUE. With a plural, with an S on the end. Yes. School cues. Okay. Like. Oh, so does that change? You got a Q. You can change if you want. That was my tell. Okay. But you don't have another tell. So do you want to change it or not? Learning trails, school cues, spell with a C, or test soup? I, I'll stick with school cues. Okay. Tyler? And read the description on school cues. No, 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 second reading. No second reading. See, you're just, look, he's panicked. No, 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 no second reading. <laughs> what are you talking about? No I know what you're reading. doing. You're stalling? No. And you're trying to get a tell from Kieran. I'm just, not looking for a tell. Your, I just need to hear it You again. heard, no, you read it to the me. Rules you give me is, your description. No, no. The rules is oh, you hear on. it once. That's no tell from Kieran. I just want to hear what school cues You pay attention here. and that's Actually, it. Go ahead. There's money in the line here. There's no changing of the rules. Which one Can I back out again? Can I Sure. Okay. I think there's already a company called TechSoup, so I'm going to go with TechSoup. 
Because they can't have the dot Test com. soup? Oh, test soup. Test. T-E-S-T. Test soup. Yeah. No, I'm going to stick with Cool Gears. I'm going to stick with Cool Gears. Okay, right. I have no sometimes, idea. sometimes that's a good thing. You stick yeah. with what your gut tells you. What does your gut tell you now? Because in poker, you want to stick with your gut sometimes. Yeah. You, you, you want to read go, on somebody. Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? You go first. I'm going to turn my. You have to turn yours over. Mine's over. Okay, which one is okay, it? Okay, I think Test Soup is the fake one. Okay, and I put Learning Trails. So this is very interesting. So someone's going to win. Somebody's going to win 60 bucks. <laughs> why, do you, why did you put Learning Trails? Okay, I put Learning Trails. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why Learning Trails is real. I'll tell you why Learning Trails is fake. Okay. It's absolutely too well constructed. Mm-hmm. It's the description a writer mm-hmm. would give because it was just so well constructed mm-hmm. and such a great metaphor mm-hmm. that a writer would come up with a metaphor like learning trails, mm-hmm. not a founder. Mm-hmm. Founders are much too close to a problem to come up with something that is so well branded like that and so well organized. I think actually since we have writers on the team, a writer would come up with learning trails. An entrepreneur would come up with something less smooth like school cues which is a bad name so therefore it's got to be real I think because if only an entrepreneur would come up with something where there's five different ways to spell it and you can't spell it over the phone right. like they just do stupid stuff like that early on and then test soup that sounds like something an entrepreneur would come up with, with as well because it's sort of a corny name but learning trails is way too polished it feels like a writer wrote it to me. And the description felt like a writer wrote it because it was like, oh, and you can subscribe to the you channels, and it was very smooth. So I think I'm winning 60 bucks. I, well, I, I think you are right. It I, felt too good. I think you're right because the metaphor came after the title, meaning mm. she got the title, and then that's the main metaphor, right, as the trail. Right. right. So when you come up with a name, then it makes, yeah, you're right. Now, why did you pick Test Soup? Way. I took test soup because I ruled out, for the opposite reasons that you like the trails, mm-hmm. I was thinking, I, I, I analyzed it wrong. I completely analyzed it wrong. I well, think, you could I think be right, was, but I mean, I what was your thinking? Trails. Yeah, okay. So um, tell us one of the fake ones. Tell us one of the, wait, no, one, one of the, of the real, real ones. ones. Tell us one of the real ones so we have a little one more One of the real ones? Tell us one of the real ones. Is school cues. <sighs> So school cues is real. Right. Yes. Okay. Now, so now it's down. We're basically now, it's between me and you, Tyler. Well, we can double down now. Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> Go 100 on top? <laughs> no on top? Let's do it, baby. I won four dimes at Kevin Paula's oh. game last week. Oh, no. I, I Want to go 100 on top? No, can I? Double. I, double or nothing. I want to bet on the same when you want to bet on. All right. Here, okay, here you go. Here's a deal for you. Here's a deal for you. I will give you $10 back. Mm-hmm. Right now, before yeah. we know the vote, I'll give you ten dollars uh-huh. back yeah. to concede my victory and give me fifty of the bucks back. So I get fifty of the sixty, you get ten bucks. You get fifty percent rebate because you feel you've lost. I'll give you fifty percent <laughs> yeah. rebate. You want your fifty percent rebate? Mm. Cutting a deal with you. I'm I'm fine with winning thirty. No, I, I mathematically I'm better off sticking with what I got. Even knowing what a bad choice you made, you're, gonna, you're not going to save it, the. T- well, you don't want to save ten dollars. Am I four x certain? You know that I'm wrong. No, so I'm going to stick with what I got. So you're sticking with test soup, okay? Yeah. And Jason has chosen learning yes. trails. I think test soup is the fake. You pick one. test soup yes. as your fake one. And I pick yes. learning trails. Yes. Who gets the money? And please, the- please, please. <laughs> <laughs> the fake startup is. Learning trail. Yes! Uh, yes! <laughs> Boom! J Cow wins again. I know. Mm, let me smell that Tyler. <laughs> oh, God. And how was my analysis? Yeah, it was perfect. I, I, think, I think you had something there. Yeah. All right, I got to give you your money back. It was no, fixed. no, no. It was fixed. <laughs> I knew. How? I'm just fing with that. Yeah, you did. Oh. <laughs> Jeez, I just cost you myself can... <laughs> Did I just drop the F bomb? You did. You did. You see that? I'm automatically giving money. That happens to me in poker, too. I win a hand, and then I give it back because I make a stupid move in the next hand. Right. Because I get too cocky. All right. What's the key? Thank you, Kieran. You did a wonderful job. I'll split the money with you guys later for setting that up nicely. Um, I'll buy you guys some pizza. What's the most important trade for an entrepreneur to succeed? Looking back historically at all the entrepreneurs you've funded, well over 100 people in the first round. And that's got to be 200 because you have so many other founders. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it's multiple founders. Is there some common trait, some common trait set amongst entrepreneurs that makes them win? Yeah, it's people, uh, people that can 
that, that kind of stay the course through, even through the rough times. Anybody can be a founder when things are going well. Mm. It's people that fold or, or even you know, can't continue to execute at the level at which they can when things, aren't, when things don't seem to be going as well as they should. Got it. So I guess that would fall under perseverance, yeah. resiliency. Yeah. So assuming people have the perseverance, we, we, we narrow the skill set, we, we narrow the pond down to the people with mm -hmm. perseverance and resiliency. What of the pitches you see, these 50 pitches, how many people coming in to pitch you do you think have that? Is it one out of five, one well, out of I, ten? I think or? that's kind of why you know, so many people talk about repeat entrepreneurs mm -hmm. uh, because you know, any repeat entrepreneur is going to have been through some rough patches ah. and, and they have a history. Now, we, we, you, know, you, know, you have to invest in people that aren't always repeat entrepreneurs. You have to invest in people yeah. that are first Especially if the name of your firm is first round. Right. And so you, There's going to be so, some first round, first and so, time. And so round. sometimes it's just, it's a gut, you talk about gut feel here in, in, the, in the context of the, 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 gambling. the gambling, right? It is, sometimes it's a gut feel. Mm -hmm. And you know, after doing it for long enough, you, you, you have a certain feel about certain founders that just, they feel like they're the type of people that are going to you know, manage that well. Mm. Um, and they tend to be very optimistic but, and very confident, but, right. also, but also they're not afraid to talk about like, wh what they don't know, mm. right? Wow, so there's a whole other subset you just whipped out there, whoa. <laughs> so they're confident, right? but they're not, they're confident and perhaps even arrogant? Eh, sometimes. Sometimes, which yeah. is generally confident. Yeah. But they're not in any way uh, hung up on what they don't know. They're willing to learn. They don't have like an ego about what right. they don't know. Right. Um, they, they're willing to s ask the question, how does that work? Or what do I need to do next? Right. Or, so they're... they're or, the, you know, I need to hire into that, you know, hire someone that can do that. I, you know, I have three names here, or, you know, I, that, that sort of thing, right? But, mm -hmm. or it, that's something that we're going to figure out in 12, 12 months from now, Got right? It. We don't need to figure out. So today. resiliency, optimism, mm -hmm. um, and then a certain humility, is it, that they don't know something? Or, or they're not hung up on not knowing something? They're not hung up. I How mean, so, you... the, so the, there, are the, there are the people that get stumped, right? And they're, and they're like, well, uh, you know. And, and that, they get that, stuck. Right. And that's, you don't want that. But then there are the people that, like, they will answer the question even if they don't know what the answer is. And that's, that's bad. Okay. Right? So you have people who get paralyzed. Right. You have people who are BS artists. Right. And then you have this third one. Mm -hmm. So you, this is an optimistic person who's confident and resilient, and they're also what's the other word that they'll they'll figure something out? Yeah. That what's that? Resourceful. Resourceful. Yeah. Maybe resourceful. That's a good word. word. Resilient, optimistic, resourceful. Mm -hmm. So do you embed like tricks into resor to test people's resourcefulness as part of meeting with them? As I hear NASA does when they call people at three in the morning to have them send over their resume again. And then people are like, well, it's three in the can I call you back or whatever? And they're like, no, we actually need this right now, like the cutoff in the next 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. To see if they can get a fax out yes. at that hour. Yeah, and in the next 30 that minutes. That is just yeah. ridiculously annoying and stupid. That's, they but call it's clever, that one of, right? They say it's one of the secret sauces yeah. of well, I mean, they, they, I mean, they did say that about Steve Jobs. He would call people at all hours of the night to right. talk about stuff. And he, I think it was probably him testing people or pushing people a little bit, prodding people. Oh, I don't uh, think so. No, he was just <laughs> I, maniacal. Yeah, I think that was just the way he was. <laughs> he was maniacal. Yeah. I, I'm really having a hard time reconciling, reconciling the individual. Would that not be the best test of, of an executive assistant, call them at 3 in the morning to tell them to fax something over? No, that would be being an a-hole. Yeah. No, I'm not saying if it's an a-hole. You saying, don't need to test. Would it be a good I, test? You know what? Listen, I, I, everybody knows. That's that the I'm, most like the everybody job, knows like I'm skill a, you're no, going to no, test Everybody for. knows I'm a hardcore guy. I'm a hard, you know, performance guy, whatever. I'm hardcore on people. I would never do something like that. That's unnecessary testing people. Right. Li life is testing enough. You know, like just your day job is testing enough. If you're having to come I up mean, with these you, additional you, tests. You actually did something like this. I did? Yeah. What did I do? You, when, <laughs> when you first wanted to meet, you asked to meet at your house. Yep. Uh, a Friday at 4.30. Oh, and my house at, is right near the On massive. the 405 in the 10. Yeah, exactly. For, yeah. If, you don't, if you don't know L.A. very well, that means it's a you, disaster. Need, you need to leave wherever you're leaving. At 3 o'clock. <laughs> no, like 2.30. Yeah. So I made it really hard. Well, not, Most people are going to screw that up. I think that was probably not callousness or a test. That was just probably not really thinking about your experience. That was probably just lack of empathy. Mm-hmm. 
Like I didn't think like what do you have to go through to get here? I, was like, <laughs> I thought I was like I was like that's an open spot on my schedule. Right. Oh, I was like this guy knows exactly what he's doing. So maybe I don't I'm know. Leave, I, you know what? So you know what I did? But you don't test people like that. No. Leave one o'clock. That's not no. appropriate for a VC no. to be doing. And, that. And you know every set of questions. I mean, I don't have like a, a, a prefab set of questions that I yeah. ask founders. I mean, I, I want to talk about their business and I want to hear and I'll probe and ask questions and you know and sometimes I'll know the answers hmm. and sometimes I won't. You've been very successful, correct? You made a lot of money. Uh, yeah. Enough money you don't have to work, right? No, no, no. no I, I don't want to talk about me. I'm not talking about me. I know, but what I'm trying to get at is I, don't, I think that you've made enough money that you don't have to work. So wh- I'm trying to get at why are you still doing this? I love what I do. You love what you do? I love what I do. I mean, what is I, it about it that you love? I, I get to meet people doing the most exciting things every day of the week, right? I mean, this is, this is the best, best job ever, right? I mean, Being a VC it, is the best job ever. Well, I think that being a... Being a you know, I, I think that some people might disagree that being a VC is mm-hmm. the best job ever. But I think when you get to work with these early stage companies, mm. if I were the type of VC that was like doing like spreadsheet analysis, ah. that would be horrible, right. right? But the type of VC that is like meeting young entrepreneurs that are that are like wild eyed about what they're doing, yeah. um, and and you know trying you trying to find huh? people that you want to work with. I yeah. don't know if anything keeps me young, but it's nice to hang out with young people. It's thrilling. Yeah, it really, and you get to do. You get to fund dreams, mm-hmm. and you get compensated well for funding dreams. Right. And you get so many swings at the bat at success, too. I mean, it's almost like, I know one person who's a VC and was an entrepreneur before, and it's like, when I became a VC, I didn't, I stopped grinding my teeth and not being able to sleep at night. Being mm-hmm. a founder is hard. Yeah. It's, how much harder is it to be a founder than a VC? Oh, it's way harder, right? I like mean, a thousand it, Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's way harder. VC is easy. I mean, it's hard to be a good VC, right, to get the return. Yeah, I don't think. But I, it's an I, easy I, it's lifestyle. Not as, it's wise. not as easy. I mean, I, I'll never forget when I first got into, um, when I first became a VC, I was at some event, and there was like a bunch of people walking around drinking cocktails, and I went up to another person who, who will remain nameless, who had also just kind of entered VC about six months previously. And I said to him, so, so how's, how's the new gig? And he says to me, beats working. He's <laughs> working. Right. And at the time, I thought, wow, I must be doing something wrong because I'm working harder than I ever have, right? Yeah, but you're working hard to get meetings and to understand these projects and doing research, but you don't have to go meet payroll. You don't have no, to. No, absolutely. It's a different You don't set have of to like, wake up in the night in a cold sweat wondering if you're going to meet payroll. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Totally different. Mm. Totally different. How's the pressure different from LP to VC than VC to CEO? That's a good question, Tyler. You're making up for that goddamn <laughs> breast augmentation nonsense earlier in the program. That's a good question. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, LPs and venture You have a certain pressure right. from limited partners to get returns, correct? I look at it very differently. I, uh, yeah. I mean, so it, here's the way I look at it, right? And I think that this is where so many VCs get it, get it wrong yeah. sometimes, is they look at their LPs as their customers. It's customers, right. Right. Yeah. And I look at these founders as my customers. Got it. And my LPs are my shareholders. Got it. And my job is to create value mm-hmm. for my shareholders, but by making my customers really happy. Got it. Right? And if I do that, then I think everything will work out. Yeah. Right? I think you're right. And people seem to love first round. I mean, you guys have a great reputation. Why is the reputation so good, do you think? I, have, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know... I, I, you don't hear stories like, oh, my God, first round, screwed this founder or that founder. You hear some other VC firms. We're, we're very focused, maybe be we're very focused on founders, right? We're very focused on founders. And we know that it is, you know, that founders start many companies and that it's a very long-term business. And you yeah. just have to think very long-term and you have to try to help What do you do you when a founder is just absolutely effing up and it's just like this person has to go? I mean, how do you, I mean, it, it does happen. It, it happens rarely. It's, it happens. How, how do you even approach that? I mean, you've been in that situation? No, no. We Haven't would never, we, 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 we've never fired a founder. Yeah. We just wouldn't do that. Right. It doesn't make sense. So we, would you rather see a founder who's screwing up sink the ship than have to fire a founder? I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give all sorts of advice to a founder. I'm yeah. going to share years of pattern matching with them. I'm going to have them talk to different people. But it's their company, and they get to do what they want. Even and with your money? Yeah. It's their company. Right. They get to do it. It's their company, their employees. So when you see a, I mean, this happens. You see a founder spiraling. Mm-hmm. It's gotta be, that's, that's got to be one of the tougher parts of the job is when a founder can't see the forest through the trees mm-hmm. and when they're going to crash and there's nothing you can do to help them. Right. That's gotta it's, be tough. it's very frustrating. 
very it's frustrating. Fresh, it's very frustrating. But, you know, it's... The, I've been involved with one or two investments like that. I've only been angel investing for three years, but, I mean, right. it's really tough when you see somebody and everybody and, knows and they come, need to change and, and they there, don't. There, there comes a point where you just, you become, like, you turn from investor to, like, uncle, right? Yeah. And just try to help them through that, let them know that everything's going to be okay, that, mm-hmm. you know, um, and, and, you know, help them, if it's going to be bad, help them make it as less bad, yeah. <laughs> right? But, you know, there's, there's, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't think there's a lot of firms that have a lot of success firing founders and replacing them with someone that doesn't have the passion. Do you ever fund somebody who just emailed you cold? No. Never happened? Never have. But you've taken meetings from people who've emailed you cold? Yeah, I have. It's interesting ideas, people, um, yeah. And so you read every email. If somebody emails you, what are the things in the email that make you go, ooh, Generally, interesting product idea. Interesting product idea. Yeah, yeah. I'll start there. And then I, th- but then I want to find out who is this person? You know, what have they done before? Who's their team? Then I want all those other questions answered. Yeah. But if they're starting with something, I go, wow, there's a way that you could do that would be really great. Mm. And nine times out of 10, or you know, 19 times out of 20, I find that you know, they're not doing it the way I thought it would be. Yeah. <laughs> right? But yeah. What's the hardest part of your job? Um, the, the hardest part of my job is probably just trying to stay on top of what everybody's doing out there and trying not to miss anything because there's so much activity. Yeah, missing, for you guys, missing the next Facebook, Uber, Square is extremely costly. Well, we're going to miss, I mean, we can't hit them all. Right. Right, and so we're going to miss things. We know that. Um, but I would have liked to have at least had a chance. What's your biggest miss in your career? Oh, well, I think that, you met with somebody and didn't move quick enough, and you missed the investment. Actually, and be, regret. so so before I joined first round. Yeah, even before. Yeah. Um, I uh, I I heard about this thing called Facebook. Oh, <laughs> oh yum yum. <laughs> and oh, oh. Um, and the so big I, I I you know I made a few calls and tried to get a meeting, and then the deal was done at at you know with Excel at you know eighty pre eighty seven pre whatever it was. Mm. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, well, that is just ridiculous. But you would have done it? <laughs> no, I don't think I would have. Ah, okay. I was so like missing brand it was new, not brand new. Right? Missing it was not that bad. No, no. What gave Excel, I mean, you've got to give them a lot of credit for that, what gave them the ability to do it? Do you think they just got the sense? I think they just had the sense, yeah. I think it's they saw the, the growth and they saw yeah. where it could go. Interesting. Um, continued success. Mm-hmm. Thank you for helping entrepreneurs. You guys have been a great force. I really have to say, like, as an entrepreneur, now mm-hmm. an angel investor, um, I'm really starting to get an appreciation for what you guys specifically do at First Round, and also True and, you know, Floodgate and Ron Conway, and mm-hmm. you guys really have done a, you know, incredible job for entrepreneurs, and mm-hmm. I really, you know, salute it as an entrepreneur and as an angel investor because it's hard to make those early bets, and you could be working at Billion, multi-billion dollar funds or raise multi-billion dollar funds and just sit there and collect those two and a half, you know, management fees and just take 20 weeks of vacation off and just rest on your laurels. But I know what you do is hard. Mm-hmm. And you guys have set it up to be almost hard to be in that early part. And it's really the, the world needs that. I mean, I really think that you guys are like the unsung heroes, really, the true ventures, all those pe- folks really yeah, operating on that early every other Every city on earth wishes they had you know, like no, but just think about it. You know, like the, you guys have an all-star team. You and Josh and, and Howard could be. I mean, Howard raised multi-billion-dollar funds with mm-hmm. Bill Gross and the idea. You guys could be doing the later stage stuff, the more glamorous stuff. I mean, you're really getting in there when it's hard and when it's needed, and that, and that really is commendable. Well, thank you. I think that really it's it's the founders that we work with that are commendable. I mean, they're, yeah, they're, we didn't they're raise special. we didn't raise the question about the elephant in the room, which is why are you in L.A.? Oh yeah, who are you investing in in L.A.? Because Tyler already knows. <laughs> oh. We spring this on you at the end. <laughs> no, what are you doing in LA? Just meeting with companies? Yeah, I was just meeting with some companies. Good yeah. companies down here now. Yeah, there yeah. are some good companies. And, you know, I also, you know, some of the incubators and so. Oh, yeah, there's five or six of them. Right. Hey, what's your take on the Y Combinator bubble? I don't know if you read my piece, but I wrote a piece on that. Is I did. I saw it come through. I haven't read it yet. Oh, yeah, so, okay. yeah. so, what did you think? I mean, you see these 15, putting aside Y Combinator, but you see $15 million caps on notes uh, in all, a lot of angel deals or uncapped notes. Were you guys invested in an uncapped note? Or is that just to you like, well, that's weird? 
I mean, that, I mean, an uncapped note seems a little weird. Right? Yeah, I wouldn't I do mean, it. Yeah, so, um, you know, I don't know that we would. Yeah. Uh, but when you see the $15 million ones, is that a good idea for entrepreneurs to be doing $15 million caps for five-person, six-month-old companies? I think we'll find out, right? But I think that, the, again, the bubble talk, I've just, I'll take it back to my discussion about bubbles. I think that people are beginning to talk about the bubble, and mm. I think that that means we, pro you know, somewhere between today and two years from now, you know, things will, yeah. will look like, oh, my God, we just had a bubble. And now yeah, we I'm just wondering if... It's not, I'm trying to figure this out myself as an angel investor because mm -hmm. I'm looking at some deals that are 10 to $15 million caps. I've never done that. And just last year, they were 6 to $8 million caps. And before that, they were priced around to 2 3 $4 million. Right. And I'm thinking, wow, maybe I should sit this out. But then I'm wondering, if they do get a VC to price it later on mm -hmm. at $15 million, mm -hmm. well, that would have proven that this is a pretty good company, right? right? So therefore, maybe I shouldn't sweat it if I didn't get that first triple... Maybe I'm going to miss the next Uber or the next Facebook mm -hmm. or the, you know. So I don't know. What, what should I, I think? I just think it's tough to time markets in general. So I should just, if I think if I love the, the company. you're in the game, you're in the game. So if I love the company, just yeah. write the 25000 or $50,000 check yeah. and just, yeah. you know. And I made 50 bucks today, so I could put that towards it. Exactly. So exactly. Hey, You've got a good start. You have been an awesome guest. You, uh, I want to squeeze in one more for the audience. Come on. One, one last one. All right. Because he's in L.A., All right. is, is Silicon Valley losing its grip on the mecca of where you need to go to start your startup. Can great companies come outside of LA? I think great outside companies of can come out of everywhere. I think that the, mm. the, the question is where do you scale and how do you scale, mm. right? And so when you need to hire hundreds of engineers. Can you do that in can Chicago? You, can you do that? New where, York. where all can you do that? Yeah. Right? And so that is the question. But I think great companies can start not just in LA and, and New York, but in Austin. In Austin. Seattle. In, I mean, we've invested in companies in Detroit and in, in uh, Louisville. Right? Really? So, yeah. Was Louisville um, Backupify? Yeah. Yeah, we both did Backupify. Yeah. yeah I, 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 um, I found Rob May because mm -hmm. I was using the product and Open I just Angel emailed him and I brought him to Open Angel Forum out here and then he yeah. moved to Boston. Yeah. So we're, we're both in Backupify. Mm -hmm. We're both in Uber. Mm -hmm. Were you guys in Reportive too? No. We're in Reportive. I bet you we have a bunch of things. Probably. We've yeah. done a bunch together. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember all of them. Hmm. This has been an amazing program. Thank you so much to our friends at eMinutes for incorporating so many great startups for free uh, and as well as Trata for helping people scale their growth, getting that paid conversion funnel doing and teaching entrepreneurs how to do it. If you're doing SEM and you're not using Trata, you're crazy. Go ahead and thank at eMinutes and thank at Trata on your uh, Twitter and Facebook accounts. And follow at First Round, at First Round, F-I-R-S-T, round on uh, Twitter. And, uh, of course, Rob Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S, on uh, Twitter. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you to Carolyn. What an amazing general manager for this weekend. And if you would like to be the CEO of this weekend, I am the interim CEO. I'm looking for a CEO. This weekend has over a half million dollars in revenue, seven great shows. you got a celebrity in Kevin Pollack. you got an Internet guy like me. you got a bunch of other great shows that are emerging, like social media and Dave Pensado's, um, Pensado's Place and sales, all these great shows happening. We need a CEO who can drive this company to the next level. We've got five or six great employees, studios, everything's in place. We just need you to be the CEO of this company. And then I've even got like the A round teed up from first round. So if we can get this same thing done here, I can just go to them and say, like, hey, listen, I got a half million dollars. I need a person to run the company because I don't have time to run two companies. Mm -hmm. That's hard. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, first round is committed to put the first round together. We've got half a million dollars in revenue. We've got all the systems in place. All we need to do is 20 more shows, get each show to 20,000 viewers, and all of a sudden, boom, boom, boing, go, half a million views on top of the half a million views we already have. No, we have a quarter million views with Kevin Pollock Show and Marshall Reynolds. Anyway, if you would like to be CEO, email jason at thisweekend.com and tell me why you should be CEO of this company. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. <laughs>